So good afternoon, everyone, and whoever is watching this out on, on country, on different countries, I'd like to begin by acknowledging country. Um, we acknowledge them that we live and we create work on unceded lands. We pay our respects to the First Peoples of Australia and to elders past, present and future. My name is Meg Upton and I'm the Education Consultant for Australian Plays Transform. And it's with great pleasure that um, I'm in a conversation today with Elena Karapetis, who is a wonderful playwright. She's also a director and an actor. And we're going to uh, dig, dig a little bit deeply today into Elena's playwriting process with a particular focus on one of her works. And this interview is, we're taking teachers and students on board and we're, we want to think, we want teachers and students to think about what is the purpose of playwriting, what is the purpose of playwriting in a very contemporary Australian uh, learning context and what are the stories that young people might want to tell through their own playwriting. Um, so we hope you take inspiration from this interview with Elena. So, Elena, I'd like to ask you, first of all, what is a playwright? Um, thank you, Meg. It's lovely to uh, meet with you all today. Uh, and I'm on Ghana country uh, in South Australia. Um, what is playwright? So a playwright is a storyteller um, who works in a different medium to say, um, oral, it's uh, oral history or poetry or, um, or novel writing. What we do is we code language onto a piece of paper and that, that code that's put onto the piece of paper uh, known as a script mm -hmm. uh, is then can, can be read um, as, a, as a piece of literature on its own but the ultimate uh, manifestation of what that script is, is when it's taken from the page and put into the mouths and the bodies of other humans, mm -hmm. uh, you know, page to stage or in the, in the you know, example of a radio play and a, an actor uh, will, be reading the, will be reading the text. So, uh, it, it, so a playwright has to figure out how to code story knowing that they're going to hand that story over to other people who will then interpret what they've done in their own way mm. which is why we have you know a million different versions of Hamlet mm -hmm. for example mm -hmm. um yeah so mm. telling stories in that in that particular way mm. very interesting the way you talk about coding isn't it because it, it kind of gives us gives a sense of, of needing to unlock it doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. In, the, in, the, in the process of um, taking it off the page. That's, yeah. That's so very interesting. I talk to, I talk to, I talk to um, people about what we, you know, what, what your job is in a, as an actor and a director, it, when I sort of flip my hats onto there, it's about decoding the text and looking for all the clues that the writer has put in there mm -hmm. about the character that you're playing or about the world. And that can, you know, that can be around about looking at the particular syntax that's used. Um, how a character speaks, the rhythm, the punctuation, like punctuation is a really big, is a really big clue. Um, and so when I became, I started off as an actor and then when I became a playwright, um, it made me a better actor because I understood the code a lot more. Mm -hmm. because I had become a coder myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's really fascinating. Um, now, in this modern world, contemporary world, where we're, we're very much using, uh, often using digital platforms, um, and there are other mediums through which we can tell our stories, why do you write plays? The reason why I write plays is because there's a, you know, we have been sitting around in the dark telling each other stories since the beginning of time, and there's something really primal about mm. that and it feels very ritualistic and sacred to sit in the dark with a bunch of people most of whom don't know each other and to release yourself and to give yourself permission as grown people to go I know I'm watching people up there pretending 
but I'm going to enter into this agreement that those people are pretending and I'm going to watch them act as though those imaginary circumstances are real and I'm going to let myself go with that. Um, I think there's a real charm about that. Um, in a world that's quite cynical, I find people sitting in the dark going, tell me a story, really, it, it warms my heart. You know, the ancient Greeks used to, if you look at ancient Greek theatre, it was almost like, it was like a sort of psychological therapy for the masses. You know, um, my apologies, my dog is in the room with me and he's, He's been sleeping all day and now he wants my attention. Listening to the story. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, so people would go, you know, people would go to the theatre in ancient Greece to wrestle with the idea of being a human being. Like how is it that these awful things happen to us and what do we do about that? And I feel that, and, you know, for different, for different cultures around the world, uh, there's a, the, the ritual of exploring and expressing our humanity and our obstacles and our sameness and our difference and our conflict and our pain and our joy. There's something I think ingrained in us as, as, as animals mm -hmm. that, that needs, that, that requires us to do that in, mm. in order to be on the planet. To speak our stories. Yeah. What sorts of plays do you enjoy writing? Um, can you, would you call? Would you say you write in a particular genre, or or what? 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 Where do your stories come from? For you? Yeah, my my stories. I took a long time to start writing. I didn't start writing until I was forty, and um, the reason why I didn't start writing for that long was because I had such. Uh, I, and I still do have a huge respect for writing, I, and it's still something that I go, oh my god, can I do it? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I I guess it's a it's about something that's kind of a question that's burning inside of me that I want to try to figure out you know there's that adage write what you know for me it's about going write what you think you know mm -hmm. and in doing that you actually figure out that it's this it's, there's this whole other kind of spectrum around that idea that you hadn't even considered and so being a writer I enjoy writing because it, it challenges my empathy Mm -hmm. and it challenges my ideas and I find that now as a human being if I come up against someone who has a different point of view to me years ago I would have like butted up against that person but now I'm really curious like how did you so you think that what is that how come how did you get to how did you get to be the person who feels that way what happened to you and what caused you to have that point of view I enjoy that I and because it makes me then become a lot more accountable about my own you know and everyone's got this propensity to 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 dismiss people and to dehumanize them if they if they have a different opinion to you um so I enjoy that I I'm, I think what drives me is curiosity about mm. people and the world is there anyone in particular in your life who you might have butted up against who um, has challenged your perspective? Um, I know I know. in a previous conversation, I think you mentioned you had an uncle. Or yeah, yeah. So, like, I have, I have lots of, I have a million people in my family and um, there, was a, there was a writing exercise that I did once when I, I did a writing workshop a couple of years ago and the exercise was to find someone in your life who has a really specific way of talking and then to find something that they believe in deeply that you disagree with. And I have this brilliant uncle and he's a really great guy, but he has a very different opinion to me about uh, capital punishment. And I, the exercise was I had to write a speech from my uncle's point of view about why he believes that capital punishment is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard, but, it, but ultimately it was really good because I think sometimes as writers we're so driven by our own points of view that we forget to, we forget that an audience isn't there 
to be lectured at. Um, I don't think a lot of audiences enjoy didactic pieces of work where they're, where they're told what to think. I think audiences enjoy being respected and entertained. And so what that has taught me to do is that if I'm writing a scene or a play about an idea that I honour, I try and have a 360 yeah. kind of view of what that idea is. I leave it up to, I mean, there is there are ways that you can do it by stealth. You can sort of, you can sort of, I'm, I'm sure that when audiences read my work or see my work, they're pretty clear about what my points of view are because of what happens to characters. Um, but I make sure that I don't, I don't want to alienate anyone in the audience, but I do want to challenge them and their points of view. So sometimes you have to put those points of view on stage hmm. as well. As and you have to honor that point of view, even if it makes you really uncomfortable uncomfortable especially if it makes you really uncomfortable by honoring that point of view at least through the prism of of theater making mm -hmm. um you honor the people in the audience more mm. yeah that's great thank you um i wanted to ask you uh also in an, in other discussions we've had in the past elena you've mentioned the impact of your greek heritage mm -hmm. and i wondered is that still a factor in your playwriting or something new that that is you draw on or influences you? Yeah, it's really interesting because I I feel like it was it's something it's like you know that there's a there's you know there's that story about there's you know a couple of you know fish in a in a in the sea and one fish comes up to the other fish and goes gee the water's really cold today and the other fish goes what's water. <laughs> um, and I feel that sometimes about my my Greek heritage. It's so ingrained in me. You know, I couldn't I could speak Greek before I could speak English, um, and so that the 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 culture and the tradition of my family sitting around a table sharing stories, and connecting in that way, and just the the way that Greek people are so hospitable and welcoming, all of that stuff. I feel not only informs what I write and how I write mm -hmm. but the actual practice that I have as an artist um, which is about connection and about finding things that we have in common as opposed to things that separate us mm -hmm. um, and you know growing up Greek as well in Australia um, you know it's that classic thing that I think you know third culture kids have in Australia I'm, cons I'm considered Greek and in Greece I'm considered Australian and it's that whole like where do I fit in like all of that stuff is really cool kind of creative grist for the meal mm. you know um, that kind of restlessness um, has made me that 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 gives me creative creative juice and, you know, stories that I heard growing up and, you know, the, 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 the kind of cultural stories that I have mm. throughout my life. But, um, yeah, and also feeling like I would go to the theatre and I didn't see anyone like me on stage. So I would sit at, you know, in the Dunstan Playhouse, you know, State Theatre Company at the Festival Centre in Adelaide, which is like my a favourite venue of mine. And I would be sitting there as a high school kid watching David Williamson plays, completely enthralled and really enjoying the work, but never, ever seeing anyone like me on stage. And so that has really driven me as well. I think mm. one of my values I think that drives me as an artist is to the importance of representation and trying to make people feel seen who maybe haven't been seen before in the way that they would like to. Thank you. It's a that's a um a wonderful kind of treat treatise on um tell your own story and honor your own um your own background and your own culture and that that can kind of that's very encouraging I think for young people um let's now take that kind of broader discussion about your playwriting um what how do you go about writing plays and do you have a particular do you 
you know, do you sit down at a certain place? Do you write at a certain time? Um, where, where, how do you go about writing a play? Um, I write, it's re it really, I find it playwriting really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I have, I have beautiful playwriting friends, you know, like my friend Duncan Graham, my friend Nikki Bloom, I can, I can name loads of people, Lachlan Philpot. I know people who get up in the morning and they sit down at their desk at nine and they write all day and then they, you know, and I'm just like, I, I, I spend a lot of time researching and then it kind of percolates in my brain and then I kind of things start to kind of putter out. Um, but I take a long time to percolate. Um, and so uh, it de depending on which, you know, each of the plays that I've written, I've had a completely different process and they're all quite different in terms of their structure and their genre. Um, so it just depends on what I'm writing. Um, at the moment, I've just handed over a draft of Antigone to State Theatre Company. It's a response to Antigone um, that is a part of the 2022 season. And I'm about to start writing a play based on the Adelaide Central Market. So you couldn't have two kind of more sort of different approaches. And I'm in the research stage. Of, of the okay. market. And so I'll sit down to write and then I'll go, oh, gee, my window's really dirty. And, <laughs> and I have to clean. So I've, I, I feel like sometimes there's no, there's no right way to write, that everybody has their own process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's encouraging too, I think. Or for, um, so some of the plays that you've written um, include Dear Australia, The Gods of Strangers, The Good Son and Gorgon. And as you just mentioned, you have just submitted a you know, first draft of, of Antigone or a... Um, uh, I think it's my ninth draft. Ninth draft. And that says a lot about the playwriting process too, doesn't it? Is that it is a drafting process. It isn't just necessarily come out so I wanted to take the the play Gorgon today um and there's a reason why we've discussed this um because of the 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 world of this play the characters within this play and the and the purpose of this interview too we're, we're working we're thinking about young people and we're thinking about students and we're thinking about what's what's play writing and play audiencing for them so if we can think about Gorgon and can you tell us a little bit about Gorgon? So things like its story, its structure, its style. So Gorgon is a play about uh, young people. It's, um, it's in two halves. The first half of the play, there are two uh, male characters uh, and it's, it's set all in one night and the style of the language is very sort of sharp and um, fun and the world kind of cuts and is exciting and it's almost like being in a video game. Um, the story in the first half is about two, two boys. It's um, Mario's 18th, 18th birthday. He's just got in a car and he's going out on a night uh, on the town um with his friend Lee and uh and it's just a, a snapshot of their life and their friendship and they go out on this night and Lee it's it's mainly told through Lee's point of view and Lee is watching himself in the world and enjoying his friend but intuitively feeling a bit uncomfortable about things that he's seeing and experiencing and feeling mm -hmm. um, and then the second half of the play so the first half ends really abruptly spoiler there's a car accident and Mario dies in that car accident and then we see one year later the actor who plays Mario then becomes Mario's sister mm -hmm. Lola and we cut to a year later and we go to Lee's apartment a really kind of shitty flat and she knocks on his door and walks in with a happy birthday balloon and has come to see him on her 19th birthday it's the first birthday without her brother and it's the anniversary of her brother's death and Lee has locked himself away um, and hasn't coped with the death of his best friend so the play is about the way I wanted to write the play because I have two nephews who I adore 
and I became aware that they were growing up in this world where the palette of expression for a boy seemed to be really limited. So they are like any kind of vulnerability or femininity is perceived as weakness, any kind of access to sort of more delicate <laughs> emotional feelings. Um, shush, that's it's seen as a weakness and the acceptable kind of palette for a boy to express himself is through anger and pride and rage and yes and um but but at the same time the suicide rate for boys is huge so we've got all of these kind of unarticulate emotionally inarticulate boys choking on their own pain the only way they're allowed to express it you know, and I'm speaking very generally, of course, but I did heaps of research around this stuff um, and that these, these angry boys grow into angry men and angry men end up, you know, uh, can often end up turning their anger on themselves and other people. And I was like, why do we do that? Like, what is that about? And so the, the, the idea to have one actor playing the basically, uh, you know, the two spectrums not that I agree that gender is necessarily a binary I don't agree with that at all but I just looked at it through the lens of boy girl like how does this person experience the world they're twins they have totally the same you know parentage and they were born at the same time but why is their experience of the world so different because of the gender that they've been assigned at birth mm -hmm. um so the second half of the play looks at this girl trying to elicit some kind of response from this kind of stone-faced boy. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. And it's a contemporary play? Yes. So it's set, it's set now. I mean, I wrote it in about 2017 maybe, but I feel like it's just as, just as um, relevant now. And it's set, you know, I've written it to be set in Adelaide, it's, um, you know, they, they talk about, I, I listened to young people on the bus a lot. I, I asked my nephews who were then like younger teenage boys about things that boys talked about and how they talked to each other and the kind of vernacular that they used. Um, it's really funny because when kids found out that, you know, uh, a lady um, <laughs> wrote the play, they were, they were really like oh which made me feel really happy because it meant that I got the language and the culture between those two boys right mm. um even though I'm not a teenage boy <laughs> I, I'm and that's really I wanted to now move on to these young audiences so how did the young audiences respond to the work Helen they responded really well I think because you know I think because when kids are taken to the theatre, often they'll see a play, you know, about the Prince of Denmark, and that play is fantastic and it's great. But I think there's just something quite extraordinary that you can give a young audience when you go, I see you, I understand you. This is, is this what you think? Is this what you experience? I think it is. And you just, you know, they come in, they're so rowdy and they're full of life and it's a really visceral and engaging and exciting uh, auditorium. Like I love, I love performing to young people because it's a really unfiltered response. Um, and as soon as the play started, you could just feel everyone, all the kids just kind of going, oh, my gosh, because I had an amazing creative team. Um, sort of lift the words from the page and, and put them on the stage. Uh, and it just, I just loved, I could hear them engaging with each other in the audience, but not in a way that was disruptive or disrespectful. So, um, but they were just animated, I think, by seeing something that was, about them and that they could relate to. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And did, did you consciously set out to write that work for a young audience? Yes. So uh, after my first play, The Good Son, was on, Geordie Brookman, who was then the artistic director of State Theatre Company, came to see the show and then asked me to pitch a show for the education season 
um, and it had, it had to be for two actors and it had to be able to tour and it had to be within a particular time frame. And um, I was like, great. And then it was just a matter of me going, what is it that I think we need to talk about mm -hmm. that we haven't talked about yet? What play do I want to see about young people that only I could write that I think other people would want to see? as well it's a lovely return to what you were saying right at the beginning too about the purpose of why we go to the theater and the big ideas that uh, help explain who we are as humans as well I think um and 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 so creating that world for them sounds like it was very special um so in terms of of Gorgon um and thinking then about let's imagine that those young people are go back to their classroom or back to their lives or back to whatever context they're in and think, I'd like to write a play. What advice might you have for them about starting or, or approaching that process? Yeah, um, the best advice I can give them is actually advice that I've heard from someone else. There's this guy called Ira Glass. I just thought of this the other day. This guy called Ira Glass, who's on NPR, he does This American Life. And there's this fantastic quote that he says, and I'm going to misquote it, but he says, you know, if you want to start writing, write. So you have your start point and then there's where you want to get to. And the problem is, is that the beginning of your writing, you're actually not quite that great yet. And so and most people, because they're not here, they're here, they give up. And what they don't understand is it's just a process of continuing to write and slowly you will close that gap and you'll get to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, um, there are people who are like totally gifted and can just, you know, and who are freaks, <laughs> <laughs> you know, who will sit down and just write the perfect play. Um, I'm not saying that people like that don't exist. They do and, you know, bloody good luck to them. That's that's amazing. But that's not me and that's not most people. Mm -hmm. um, but my advice would be to think about what it is that they really want to share with the world about how they experience the world and what is it that they haven't seen yet and to lean in to those parts of themselves that are unique and that are different, to let their freak flag fly and not smooth off the edges to try to please some benevolent writing being, you know. Um, only it's interesting when you read someone's work and you can see that they're trying to sound like another writer what I would say that to young writers is use your voice, use your experience, mm -hmm. use your inter intelligence, use your point of view, because we have everybody else's already. Let's let me see yours. Mm. Um, but that it will take a bit of time for you to figure out how to write a play. And and the other part of that is when you do see plays or read plays, shift your perspective from being just a passive consumer to going why is this play working what is it that the writing is doing that is making me sit forward in my seat or if it's not working why isn't it working and to become your own kind of teacher about good and bad writing to really engage critically with what the play is doing that makes it work or not work and to figure out why is that a play and why is that a film script? Mm. Why is that a poem and why is that a novel? Like what is the genre of theatre and what makes this a play? Mm. Yeah. That sounds like really good advice. Did you write, did you do, before you became a playwright, did you do lots of writing yourself as a young person? I wrote um, in a journal. Mm. I still journal from time to time. And, but I feel like my writing is almost a weird sort of journal now, my plays, mm -hmm. um, about the things that I'm kind of consumed with in my life, my, the ideas that I'm trying to unpack. And, I, you know, I would write really kind of emotionally charged and terrible kind of short stories <laughs> that I don't think I'll ever show anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about, you know, that stuff is, is like, it's like doing... Um, it's like doing piano scales in a way. Mm -hmm. it just it just gives you it just lets you exercise your muscles. Um, I write everything 
eventually on my laptop, but I have hundreds of moleskins. Notebooks. Yeah. Notebook. There's something about writing, like the physical action mm-hmm. of writing something by hand. It becomes like doing this is not the same as mm. that. There's something, there's a different physical, it's far more like visceral, it's far more, it uses far more, even though it's only that compared to that, it uses far more of your body, I think. Yeah. yeah. Write things by hand, yeah. Mm. Hey, there's a question I forgot to ask you before, so I'm going to ask it now. So the play is called Gorgon. Yes. Where does that title come from? So um, a gorgon is um, from Greek mythology and so Medusa was a gorgon. So gorgon is like an, is a female monster with snakes for hair and if she looks at you, she can turn you to stone. And scholars were, scholars have talked about, classical scholars talk about the gorgon being like the representation of the oppressed feminine. Um, when the world shift from a matriarchy to a patriarchy, the oppressed feminine was rising up and, and it kind of came out in oral histories and, and um, you know, in Homeric poems and mm-hmm. uh, as, as this kind of monstrous female. And the reason why I use that as the title is because Lola, when she goes to see Lee, her vulnerability to Lee is monstrous. Her vulnerability is scary. Her tears, her yearning, her invitation to him to show his vulnerability and his grief is terrifying. So she is like, she might as well be this Gorgon. And when he does see her, he turns to stone. And he's like, I don't want to have anything Mm. to do with you. Like he doesn't speak to her for like, there's... The, you know, the opening of Act 2 is Lola is a monologue because Lee just refuses to look at her, refuses to speak to her. Mm. He just turns to stone. And I just thought that that was a really interesting flip that the feminine and the, the feminine is dangerous and the feminine is scary, not only in, in seeing femininity in other people but in in boys seeing accepting and loving the femininity in themselves Mm. Mm. that's really powerful and I think you know giving a title to your play is kind of gifting an idea isn't it or a you know something of yourself in that and I and I'm really glad I asked that question at the end because it was (laughs) such a great response um Thank you very much, Elena, for that, that beautiful conversation. And I know I'm hoping that teachers and students are feeling deeply curious about this play. And it is available on the Australian Plays Transform um, website uh, for purchase and for study. And um, so we invite schools to do that and to engage with this wonderful play and look forward to perhaps what your next uh, adventure is going to be and seeing that in the theatre. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's funny because I feel like Antigone is is a kind of companion piece to Gorgon because Antigone is about girls. Okay. Uh, and about how uh, girls are limited by society and girls are silenced, that we have, we have Antigone, who is the first character in Western theatre to say, to speak truth to power, to say no to a king. And she was a girl. She was a 16-year-old girl. And now I'm looking, th- I'm looking now at all these amazing young people, girls, um, but also young people who are speaking truth to power, people like La- Malala Yousafzai, people like Greta Thunberg, people like Ex Gonzalez, um, the singer Kiki, all of these girls are sort of standing up and, and saying, you need to listen to us. And yet at the same time, I feel that girls are at the bottom of the rung. Mm-hmm in terms of our society and our culture and, and, and Antigone. So then the way that Gorgon is about boys and the way that we limit and crush boys, Antigone is about the way that we limit and crush girls. Mm. That's beautiful. They sit, they do sit indeed. They sound like they do sit indeed as companion pieces. Um, and I love 
as a personally, I love the fact that theatre can have a really strong politic as well mm. and be and really touch those really big core issues. Thanks again, Elena. It's been wonderful in conversation with you. Thank you, folks, and thank you for supporting uh, Australian playwrights and Australian theatre in your work. Thank you.